is Tracy Cook and welcome to the podcast series Victim to Victory. This series gives a voice to those that have overcome obstacles in all forms that dare greatly to share their real stories. Amazing humans that have seen hope and risen above those adversities to become victorious now that they go on to support and inspire others to do the same. And today we are giving a voice to Terry Kozlowski and let me Let me share a little bit about her before I do a warm welcome to you here today. She is a proud Native American warrior and she journeyed through the pain of uh, child abuse and I'll let her share that story with you if she wishes. And she's rediscovering her true path in life Uh, one of joy and love, which is wonderful. And she learned to transcend the fear Um, that the egoic mind keeps bringing to the forefront of our lives. I think that is a very important piece of our next guest today. She has got a wonderful story. So welcome, Terry, to our series. Thank you very much for having me, Tracy. I'm glad to be here. You're more than welcome. So your journey has been quite a personal one. And sharing that journey and transcending through that fear, because that's what we're going to be sharing snippets of today, transcending fear. And as a, uh, a life coach as well, you have got such an outlook on the way you see the world and drawing from your personal experiences. Where does your journey start and who is Terry? My journey actually starts when I'm 11 years old, but I want to do a little preface before I get to when I was 11. I believe that we are all born knowing who we are. We know what our purpose is. And then we go through what I call the domestication process from our parents, from peer pressure, and we lose sight of who we authentically are. In my case at age 11, I was pushed out of who I was authentically because of childhood trauma. My mother uh, was an alcoholic. She was a drug addict. And my parents divorced when I was eight years old. And my dad got custody of my sister and I, which was, he was the first man in the state of Maryland here in the United States who got custody of two small girls away from their mother. So this was back in the early seventies. And when we went to visit my mother, uh, she was living in New Mexico and we were in Pennsylvania. And I had at that point not seen my mother in almost four years. And when we went to visit, she had told my dad she was no longer drinking, that she was in AA. And we get there and the first two weeks are fabulous. And some of the best memories I have with my mother occurred in those two weeks. Then she started drinking. And once she started drinking, things spiraled rather quickly. And codependent behaviors that I had prior to the age of eight I had then started resuming those behaviors, taking care of my mother, taking care of my little sister, who's 11 months younger than I am. So we're very close in age and taking on those responsibilities that should never be given to a child, especially one of 11 years old. So she's drinking one night, everybody is asleep and she allowed three men to take away my innocence so she could have drugs. So I was uh, sexually abused at the age of 11, so she could have drugs, and then she disappeared for three days. And in her three days absence, my sister, um, she had been drugged. They drugged her so she would stay asleep. So I'm checking on her, making sure she's breathing, making sure she has a good heart rate. And I don't know anything about breathing rates or that she should have a heartbeat or anything like that. This was all intuitive of me taking care of her. My mother reappears on day four and literally takes our suitcases, sticks them out on the front stoop and tells us it's time for us to go home, shuts the door, locks it, and that she literally abandoned us on the streets of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now I have to get my sister and I home to Pennsylvania. We get home, get off the airplane, and I walk up to my dad very calmly and tell him we need therapy. Now, At 11, I shouldn't even know what therapy is. And this is back in the early 80s. So really and truly therapy was not the best option because they didn't quite know what to do with me. They knew something was wrong. 
they knew there was abandonment, but I actually never told the therapist I was in therapy until I was 18 that I was raped. That's a and huge burden, burden to kind of take on and keep as a secret too, Terry. What, I didn't have the language to actually come out and say what had happened. Certainly not at 11 or 12 or 13. Maybe when I hit my teenage years, now I would understand what sex was. I would have understood what had happened in a different light, but I didn't have the language. And then how at that point, why didn't I say anything earlier? And then, you know, the ego plays this fabulous game with us where we take on things that are never meant for us to take on. I took on shame. I took on blame. I took on all kinds of negativity that I could have prevented this. So the reality was I could not have prevented it. I should not have taken on any shame. It certainly wasn't my fault. So I shouldn't be blaming myself. And yet the ego does, does exactly that. It tries to then figure out ways to protect you from other people. And for me, that protection was over protection because if you cannot trust your mother, who can you trust? So I was hypersensitive to any, anything that could possibly, I thought could harm me in any way. I didn't trust people, you know, not at all. You can't trust others. You can't trust your mother. So I'm going through all this through high school. And I get out of high school and I go to college and I have a gentleman tell me in college that I was getting something out of playing the victim. And I got very angry with him. And, but at the same time, something stuck. It, it kept playing, going around and around in my head because it was a truth. And when, when we hear truth, our soul rises up and says, hey, think about this. Sit with this for a while. So I did. And what I realized was I was getting to be left alone. People treated me differently when I played the victim. And as the victim, I didn't want people bothering me. So I spent a lot of time alone and I was okay with that. Because when you are inside your head, when the ego is playing around with the blame and shame and judgment that you do to yourself, you want to be left alone to wallow. You want to be left alone in your depression. You don't want others reaching out to you. You don't want others trying to console you. And yet at the same time, that's exactly what we need. We need those people connections. We need to know that we're okay, despite the fact what the ego is telling us. So I did a major shift. That was my first major shift where I decided that there was a better way for me to communicate my needs and the desire to be left alone most of the time. So I switched from being a victim and I became a survivor. And when you become a survivor, the second thing that happens is that you become responsible for you. When you become a survivor, I can no longer blame my mother for the choices that I am making moving forward. I can no longer blame the three men who raped me for the decisions I am making in relationships moving forward. I am now responsible. So that was the second big shift. And when you become responsible, a third fabulous thing happens. You empower yourself because now I'm in charge of my life. My past is not dictating my present, nor is it dictating my future. So in one mindset shift, you end up incredibly moving in a different direction. You become responsible for the decisions you are making, and you become empowered to know that the past does not have to maintain your present or your future in a wallowing negative way. And that is such a powerful message. And I think people will draw a lot of inspiration from that, especially if they're going through or just overcoming a trauma as well. To be able to do that mindset shift takes a lot of inner thought, a lot of time with yourself to say, hey, wh where am I going to go from here? Why am I feeling so stuck? What has to change for things to change? Uh, so we're not always holding up that victim card. So we're not always reliving the same inner critic inside our head. So I think that's a very powerful message. Whereabouts did you go from there, Terry? 
So I'm going through college, I get married and I go, I find out I'm pregnant and I had not planned on having children. So me, I was on the pill, um, faithfully on the pill and I, yet I still got pregnant. So the universe was clearly wanting me to have a child because, because of my trauma, I did and I knew I was, I believed I was damaged because when you have gone through something like that, something can't be perfectly right with you. So I, I knew I was codependent. And so I'm pregnant and I'm going through now. I have to overcome this codependency. I have to figure out what it is that causes me to rise up and take control, take care of everybody else around me to the detriment of myself. It must have taken me more than nine months to be complete this goal because I didn't have my son until he was 10 months in gestation and they had to force him out. But when I had my son, there were complications and I didn't actually see him until he was six hours old and I am holding him and I'm looking down at him and I'm thinking to myself, he's going to leave me. So I realized at that point that the abandonment issue is now taking center stage in my life and that I believe everybody's going to leave me. And more importantly, I started seeing patterns where I was causing people, pushing them away on purpose without actually realizing I was doing it. So this was a second pattern that I had to overcome and understand that when we believe that everybody will leave us, we make sure it happens. So that, and the ego absolutely makes sure that it happens because it is to us again, and it uses it as, told you they'd leave you. Yep. Yep. They're going to leave you. Watch, watch, just watch what happens. And yet our behaviors is what causes them to leave because we are not fully participating in the relationship. We're withholding ourselves. We're withholding our authenticity. And when you ask anybody, do you want me to be real with you? Do you want me to put on a mask? Everybody wants you to be real with them. And the reality is we have to first be real with ourselves for us to be real with anybody else. Definitely 100%. Now, it sounds like the, the few stages that you've gone through so far, especially up to the point where you've had your son, there's been a great awareness. Um, so you're kind of stepping back, having a look and seeing what the universe is going to deliver to you next. And, and you're looking for the signs. Uh, was that always like that? Yes, I've, I've been a, a very aware person. I was a very aware as a child. And I think that part of the reason that I was able to move through these set, these areas, um, maybe not as quickly as I would have liked, but move through them nonetheless, was because I was aware. And when one major thing ended, there would be, a, I wouldn't call it a lull, I would say there's a more of a peaceful time before the next thing issue arose. And that's really when you look at your life as a whole, whether you have trauma or you don't have trauma, that's how life is. You go over one hurdle and then you rest, then you go over the next hurdle and then you rest. But that's our growth. That's our, op when we have a growth mindset and we're growing and learning and expanding who we are and discovering who we are, because I think ultimately that we all go through the domestication process, even if there is no tr trauma. We all go through the domestication process and we lose sight of who we authentically are. And part of our journey, you know, part of the reason you have a midlife crisis is because you realize you aren't happy because you are playing a role. You are wearing a mask. You have your armor on instead of being who you are meant to truly be. So ultimately our journey back to spirit, our journey back to our soulful self is the ultimate journey we all take, whether there's trauma in it or not. And we go through these little life hurdles. We go through this growth process to that next level. And for me, my levels were very clear cut because if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, safety is the first one. Actually, the first one is um, being able to have all your needs met. And I always had food, clothing, roof over my head. The second one is safety. And that for me was the hardest one to get. And I didn't get it until I was almost 30. And uh, I met my current husband. And I couldn't figure out what 
why I felt so strained when I was with him. And it finally occurred to me, I felt safe. What is this? You know, I had gone from the time I was 11 until I'm 27, where really and truly feeling safe was not part of my daily life. I was always on high alert. I was very high strung, high stressed, uh, very anxious. I went from being in a depression in my uh, teenage years to being very anxious and on anxiety medication in my 20s. So I went from one polar extreme to the other. Um, depression, I call it being focused on and stuck in the past. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is that area where you are focused and anxious and fearful of the future. So I went from one extreme to the other. And when I met my current husband and felt this safety, it's like, what is this? And I was very cautious, but at the same time, marrying him was the first time I ever followed my heart. Um, and we've been married for almost 30 years now. Oh, excuse me, almost 25 years. We were talking about our 30th wedding anniversary, um, almost 25 years now. And interestingly enough, as soon as I felt safe, the massive amount of growth spurt occurred. Because when you get to the second level and you can start looking at relationships with others, you can start looking at the relationship with yourself. You can start looking at your relationship with the universe, however you want to see that. But you can't do that unless you're safe. Definitely. And safety is something that we actually strive for, we crave. And when it actually appears to us, we still kind of wear that mask in a way. So it takes some people a little longer to really open their arms to, to fully fall into that safety and, and, and unpack all of that. And somebody said to me once, you know, um, whether it's personal, professional growth or development, new level, new devil. So as one kind of thing opens up, another thing comes to test us. So when we get to that place of where we want to actually feel safe and somebody provides provides that for us and we're not familiar with us and I love the way you explain that Terry um, to actually embrace it and to trust your own intuition because you'd been fight or flight uh, from mm -hmm. 11 to 27 mm -hmm. so you, you've had great awareness throughout this whole entire life journey and to suddenly go, you know what, I'm going to be open to feeling safe because my intuition is telling me to go with it. And when you said that growth spurt, um, tell us a little bit about the kind of things that really stood out to you the most during that growth spurt of feeling safe. So when I started feeling safe, the, the next phase for me was to learn how to actually deal with others better. So my husband called what I do, what I did at the time, the sledgehammer of truth. So I was always very honest and very truthful for pe with people and would let people know ahead of time that I'm probably am going to say something they don't like. And when they asked me a question, if I knew they weren't going to like my answer, I would always let them know, are you sure you want me to tell you? You're not going to like what I have to say. And they always said yes, because everybody wants the truth. And then I would whoosh, give them the sledgehammer of truth and walk away. And that was the wrong thing I did. So telling the truth wasn't necessarily the bad part. It was that I wasn't tactful about it. And then I would walk away from the situation and let them deal. So part of me during the first aspect of this growth spurt was learning how to not wield the sledgehammer of truth, but understand that being tactful and making right relationship connections and being not just honest, but caring and compassionate when you're honest so that that connection with that other human being is one of unconditional love, one of acceptance occurs. So that for me was the next stage. And it's amazing how the universe works because I got heavily involved in a Cub Scout group. So I was learning how to deal with the kids. I was learning how to deal with adults. And then when we moved, we ended up in what I affectionately call the biker gang, um, where we were dealing, you know, with motor 
cycle people in the um, Golden Road Rider Association and dealing with adults again and how to learn to coexist. And in that organization, the second level of that is understanding when to allow others to rise up and use their talents instead of me always taking over. Because that it was my other thing that I did was I just went ahead and took over the situation because nobody else is going to do it as good as I was. That wasn't the case. There's different ways to do the same thing and reach the same goal. Everybody has a different path to take. And if you learn how to go in and work with people and form a team and allow those people's talents to rise to the surface and let them help and that I was the organizer I was I can organize anything so I would go in and organize but I would allow other people to come in and use their talents and help and so that was stage two of dealing with others and then when I left all those organizations and it's amazing again the unit so I was with Cub Scouts for six years I was with the Golden Road Rise Associations for six years and then we moved and the universe said, it's time for you to be alone. And in my aloneness, I learned who I authentically was. I learned to reconnect with my divine self. I learned to listen very carefully to my soul's whispers. And that's when I learned that quiet time is essential, not just for me, but for everybody. Because when we get quiet, it's the only time we can actually listen and clearly hear our soul's whispers. That still small voice is our soul speaking to us. And if you are listening to the egoic mind, which is very loud and boisterous and, and all of that, always chattering away, I finally learned how to stop the chatter. So, and that's a whole other story I've been trying for years to meditate. So Deepak Chopra and Oprah Winfrey came out in 2012 with a 21 day meditation. I have done every single 21 day meditation they've ever put out, including the one they have out now. And I tried, I would try to use the mantras and to meditate. And in 2014, yeah, 2014, no, 2015, I started taking yoga class. And I was taking over for about six months, three days a week. And during Shavasana, which is the uh, last 10 minutes of um, the different yogas that I was doing, is corpse pose. You lay there. Some people fall asleep, which is not the intent. But I'm laying there. And the idea is that you're supposed to rest and you're supposed to recharge yourself to move on to the next phase. During Shavasana, about six months into it, I realized I had no thoughts. Well, that's weird. Why that's am wonderful. I not having, why am I not having any thoughts? And it was for the first time I realized, oh, this is what meditation is. So I thought it was rather unique and then was afraid to quit yoga <laughs> and continued on for another six months before I my schedule changed and it was harder to go to yoga class. But now I can at any moment in time clear my mind. And my husband will say to me, what are you thinking about? I said, nothing. And he said, really? You're not thinking about this? I'm thinking about nothing. And now the chatter of my ego is minuscule compared to the endless chatter I had in my head from the time I was 11 until 2015 when I was finally learned and understood what meditation is it takes a long time to sit in that silence and really clear that and to connect with yourself in that silence I'm still working on that myself in meditation <laughs> because I do fall into the chatter but when you do have that defining moment as part of meditation you finally go like you said ah this is what meditation is. And finally, you're not thinking, what am I going to cook for dinner tonight? And what about mm -hmm. that note I've got to do and blah, blah. When you actually sit there in silence, it just opens up just this amazing, clear articulation and clarity space 
for you to receive the messages that you're meant to receive. And um, I've only experienced it once and I'm still working on it. So I, <laughs> I'm really glad you kind of mentioned that because you think because you do it once and it's going to happen every time. And for some people, yes, it does. And some people, they still have to work at that and work at that chatter and, and, and really connect in the silence and just to be, just to sit there and just really just be. Um, and be in that moment as well. And you talk a lot about transformation. And we, we've, we've witnessed here today with you talking about the transformations and the awareness as you've gone through your journey. And a lot of what you do and, and link to your past experiences is transformation and mm -hmm. overcoming those fears and those self-limiting beliefs and creating such awareness from that. So now that you've cleared your mind and you can um, not listen to the ego as much, where does your journey take you from there? That is where everything's shifted into now I have to serve and now I want to serve. And now that I have transcended the fear and I understand what uh, living in utter fear is, living in the past is, I've lived in the future and became anxious and I've moved through all of that. I know how to create better interpersonal communication, better relationships with others, better relationship with myself. When you move through all that and you realize I can help people, that becomes what your mission is. And my mission now is to help especially women overcome trauma, overcome their fear and limiting beliefs. And most of that revolves around reframing the stories we tell ourselves and being able to understand that there's a different perspective. Yes, I was had horrible trauma at, during childhood. Yes, I was a victim. You transform and reframe that story to I am a survivor. You transform your the egoic perspective into, uh, yes, I was raped by three Hispanic men, but I've worked with more Hispanic men and I have more positive experience with Hispanic men than I do negative. Therefore, my ego, when it sees a Hispanic man says, hey, watch out. I can tell my ego, no, there's nothing for me to be afraid of. And it's learning how to understand when we're fearful, what it causes that fear. And normally, it doesn't really evolve around anything that is quite fearful. There is no tiger getting ready to pounce on us. We're not out in the woods picking berries and a bear is in the woods with us. What our ego has transformed into, because it had a valid purpose. And if we are in the woods hiking and we see a bear, it's going to tell us to run. That's its job. But now in today's society, having somebody hurt our feelings is not the response the ego is supposed to be giving us, okay? And the reality is they didn't hurt your feelings. Something in you was triggered and you think they hurt your feelings, but all they did was trigger you and you're responsible for how you feel. Nobody can make you feel anything. And that's what a lot of people, especially those of us who've been in trauma, don't realize is that I am responsible for how I act, how I respond and what triggers me. If you, Tracy, say something to me that triggers me, it's not your fault. Did you and I have a long conversation about all my triggers? No, we did not. So how can it be your fault for triggering me? It's my fault either for not telling you, especially if you are you have a known trigger that's, that most people will trigger. When I was in uh, high school and college, somebody tapping me on the shoulder from behind, I would come around with a fist getting ready to hit them. So I knew that was a trigger. So I told friends, just holler my name. Don't tap me on the shoulder. You won't like my response. So being able to communicate your triggers is your responsibility. So that if a stranger comes up behind you and taps you on the shoulder and you come around swinging, you are aware enough to pause and not actually hit them because they didn't know that that was a trigger. So we're responsible for how we feel. We're responsible for how we respond or how we react. And the reality is we can all choose to respond from a place of love if we pause, but we have to pause. 
the ego automatically reacts. If you react negatively to any situation, something in you was triggered, something in you, the ego reacted to. But if we paused for a moment and take a deep breath, or pause to have the thought, okay, soul, what is it that I, how am I supposed to respond to this? You will always respond from a place of love. That pause disconnects the egoic mind and allows you to actually think through what are my options? What are the different ways that I can move forward into either a resolution to whatever the situation is or move forward from a place of love? I think that's a very um, valid tip almost Terry as well because we can't control we can't control anything outside Mm -hmm. of our own responses Mm -hmm. and when we actually like you said uh take that breath and take that pause just to assess the situation okay how do I need to respond to this you know what does what is this asking from me and how do I want to respond to it And nobody knows everybody's triggers. Nobody knows everybody's boundaries or history or anything like that. You could be sitting next to somebody on the bus. You don't know their story. You don't know what language they, they speak, what, what, what what their past is. If they've traumatized, Mm -hmm. we don't know anything, but we can control how we respond. And just by being human and being nice and showing that empathy, um, of understanding that's what's going to be the change in the world and that's what the world needs more of so thank you very much for sharing that almost worldly tip uh with our audience today as well and um i wanted to touch on as well uh you recently um a little while ago uh released a book if you don't mind me asking you a little bit about that as well and it is available on Amazon. We'll, we'll share your, your links for that as well. And tell us a little bit about your book because no doubt some of your story is in your book. Talk us through that. So the book really is my story. And I had been asked for 20 years to write my story. And it was not just no, it was hell no, I wasn't going to do it. And then I turned 50 in 2018 and became pregnant with a book. And in nine months, that book was written, the first draft. And it went from a lot of words to being quite condensed. And um, it's now like 140 pages. So it's not a long book, but it's my story in six parts. And the, each of the chapters begins with a, with a stanza of a poem that I had written first. The title of the book and the poem came and then um, the book was written. Uh, just it literally poured out of me. I had no outline. I, how I did it is probably not recommended by anybody that teaches you how to write. (laughs) Um, But it was, but it was something that just happened. You know, it it was meant to be. And the final product is uh, really talks about the fact that chapter one is we're all born whole. Chapter two is the trauma. Chapter uh, three through six are the steps I use to overcome. And part of the realization when I wrote the book is that we're born whole. And despite the trauma, we still remain whole. And we all, those of us who have gone through trauma, believe we're broken, believe we're flawed, have this belief that something was taken from us that we could never get back. And yes, maybe our innocence was taken. Yes, maybe um, a piece of us was damaged, but the reality is we're still whole. The reality is that the universe knew this was going to happen to us and there's a way for us to overcome. There's a way for us, there's a path for us to take to get to the other side where we can say, yes, this happened to me, but I reframe the story I tell myself And I'm telling a story of transcending fear. I'm telling a story of transformation. I'm telling a story of self-love. I'm telling a story of self-care. I'm telling a story of how I can go out into the world and help others overcome too. So the book Raven Transcending Fear is about my story. And the Raven aspect is has to do with the fact that my Native American clan is the Raven clan. And um, the poem talks about different aspects of the Raven and the um, forward to the book really goes into the Native American heritage, not only for me, but also throughout time, how the Raven has 
have such symbolism in transformation. You see a lot of it's negative because you see ravens and crows at death. But the reality is they're there to help the spirit transcend to the next realm. So it's always about transcendence. It's always about transformation. It's always about taking something negative and bringing it to the positive. What a powerful message, Terry. And I really encourage all of our audience to um, grab your book and work through those because it sounds like writing that book was almost another element of therapy for you as well, mm -hmm. that process and that condensing and and the clarity and articulation you must have got from that writing process. Would that, would that be true, Terry? That would be true. And the reality is I think that's what caused me to... Um, very succinctly determine the path that I wanted to take to help others. And the book is the foundation for that. And all the things that I've done because of the book. So the, the blogging, uh, I have a podcast, Soul Solutions. All of this came from the idea that the book was the foundation and all these other avenues are ways for me to reach an audience to help them overcome and transcend their own fears. I love how you've overcome your obstacles. You're giving people a helping hand up and you're serving others within the world and the communities because you, Terry, are the change that the world actually needs now. What kind of Thank message you. would you like to, you're more than welcome, what kind of message would you like to leave our audience on today? That you are worthy just as you are. There's not anything you have to do. There's not anyone you have to prove things to. You are worthy of love. You are worthy of your self-care. You are worthy just because you are here. Your authentic self is exactly what the world needs right now. And for you to come out into the world and help those exactly where you are, overcome exactly what you are to help them overcome is your purpose in life and understanding that you don't have to prove anything you're worthy of love just the way you are i love that terry thank you so much for serving our audience today thank you very much for being brave uh continuing to to tell and share your story and we'll be sharing where to connect with you as well. You are very appreciated here in our community and you will find the Victim to Victory podcast series on YouTube, Spotify, Apple and our Facebook group. Please subscribe, share and comment to help be the change that the world needs. And I would like to leave our audience with a message today, Terry. So thank you very much. Step in. Thank you for story. having me. You're welcome. Step into your story, figure out who you are and do it on purpose. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, Tracy.